Uh, hi everyone, I'm Chris Aitchison. Uh, I work at a company called Ferocia. Um, I lead the engineering team for UP, which is, if you haven't heard of it, it's, uh, sorry. if you were thinking about banking from scratch with a modern technology bent, then we like to think this is how you build it. So uh, simple stuff like time of day. Sounds, sounds easy, doesn't it? You don't get time of day from any of the big four, I don't think. And uh, so basically, We've uh, got a team of about 20 developers down in South Melbourne where uh, we build uh, up. Anyway, uh, excuse me. So, data democratization. Basically, I've worked at a lot of places where, is this, is this too close to my mouth? where uh, information is siloed. So you have a lot of people in the organization, like whether they're product managers or executives or developers, where if they need to solve a problem or, or make a micro decision, basically in, in, in a course of any day, a developer's making dozens of decisions to, to do their job. Do they have all the information that they need in order to do their job? So <clears throat> what we do at Ferocia is basically whatever we need to do to open up uh, access to our data to everyone on the team, and we think that that basically makes everyone uh, make better decisions. So we're going for the, the second definition here. Make the insights that are, we generate in the company accessible to everyone. And that might be useful to executives where they're doing commercial deals, trying to understand the customer behavior in order to to work out who to partner with. So for example, with UP, we, we knew a lot of our customers were using Afterpay, so make a deal with Afterpay to integrate with them and, uh, and do smart receipts. Uh, product managers might wanna know, say for example, the purchasing behavior of customers. So if they know, for example, that everyone buys a lot of coffees in the morning, they might say, oh, there's potential there to do something special. Um, or if they know that uh, you know, customers have certain savings behavior, they can, they can optimize for that. Or designers might want to know things like, hey, I'm building a new feature. How many accounts does the average customer have? How many have one account? How many have three accounts? How many have 50 accounts? And they can use that in order to, to design the right solution for uh, the, the right amount of people. And of course, developers. Developers, sometimes they're an afterthought when it comes to access to data and insights, but uh, they probably need it the most. So when people are... Uh, uh, troubleshooting issues or, or just building a feature. Um, it's, it's probably a cultural thing, especially in a, a big company where, um, maybe like the big banks, where uh, things sort of tend to come from above and by the time it gets to software developers, they're sort of just doing what they're told. But in a small company, the culture's more, the developers are basically being empowered by the rest of the company and, and a lot of a majority, I'd like to say, if anyone else who's not a developer from our company is listening, uh, of the of the awesomeness sort of comes from the engineering capability and, and the ability of of the people actually uh, doing the work to make the right decisions when they're implementing features. Um, and a lot of that's just hidden from, I guess, uh, I guess basically non-engineers tend to not necessarily understand the complexities of of all of the little details that you need to get right. And the more context you can put in developers' heads, the better. So we do a few things at, uh, at UP to, I guess, unlock all of the, of the data that we have in order to get it in everyone's brains. So we, we have uh, information radiators physically on the wall. We have uh, behavioral analytics um, measuring, uh, for example, behavior through sign-up flows, et cetera. We have uh, uh, system metrics where we can sort of see the health of our platform. And we have uh, sort of a business insights engine where we might uh, be able to find out facts like, oh, how many people catch Ubers in the middle of Saturday night? So I, I might just uh, touch on each of them briefly. So the information radiator is one of the first things we implemented when we, when we started to uh, uh, get some good traction with up. Basically, we have throughout the office, you know, some big screens, um, just showing some real key metrics that everyone can get behind, mainly related to growth, um, you know, how many customers we have, how much are they doing, and they sort of tend to be up into the right charts, but it's really good because when something's going awesome, the sort of team rallies around it and there's a bit of buzz and everyone gets excited and, 
Um, it's really good for morale like that. So that's the main benefit of the information radiators. One of the one of the downsides is like because they're sort of, uh, well, the one at the top at least is like hand lovingly handcrafted. Um, that's it's a, a little bit of effort to to chop and change, you know, to, to answer different questions and to rearrange it might be like a, a card we put on our wall when it takes a dev a few days. So in that respect, it's relatively static, um, but the benefits outweigh the, the downsides. And the thing underneath you see is our, they're called smurls. They're basically real uh, flippy, numbery things that every time something happens, they go flip, 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 flip. And so every time we sign up a customer, uh, it goes flip, 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 flip. And that's, that's good, that's good. That's, it's like the old, you know, everyone time, every time someone makes a sale, they ring a bell or something like that. This is, this is what we have, and uh, we like it. For behavioral analytics, we, we use a tool called Amplitude. Um, and, and the key thing, I think, when, when uh, integrating with, you know, software as a service products for your analytics is to solve the problem of privacy to make sure that uh, you only send enough data to them so that you can actually give access to everyone on your team. So if, if, you, if you go down a path of, okay, I'm just going to ship all sorts of things like, I don't know, maybe like financials or, or people's names or something like that, which you, you shouldn't do, but some companies can. We can't. We have to uh, sort of, we're a bank, we have to do things uh, in compliance with a whole bunch of standards. Um, <clears throat> then... If you if you do ship stuff like that, you can't you can't open up the access because now you've got a privacy problem. So, we use behavior analytics as sort of anonymized data that uh, will tell us uh, basically what you're seeing. A little screenshot up on the top there is our sign up flow, the average time to complete from time someone opens the app uh, for the first time to when they're getting their card, and you know the average is that like little thin vertical line that's. Uh, it's just under three minutes. And so this sort of uh, behavior analytics uh, product is super valuable for, uh, for example, our product manager, trying to understand whether people are using a feature that he thinks they probably would use. Um, you know, we, we did a little uh, feature a few months ago where you can uh, pull down to refresh the activity feed, but it doesn't do that, it just saves you a dollar. And you know, we can come in here and work out how, how many people are discovering that? How, what type of customers are discovering that? Oh, okay, well, um, what, does that, what effect does that have on how many transactions they make? And we, you know, we can find correlations like that. So it's really powerful like that. Uh, another thing that this is really good for is uh, understanding, I guess, the sequence of behavior in, in, your, in your product where uh, you might think you know what customers are doing, but sometimes they surprise you. You realize that they're using uh, the product in ways you don't expect, or maybe they're going to screens in a different order than you think, and, and this is a great tool for that. And uh, we... We basically integrate with this, both from our native app with some JavaScript and from our Rails app with a, a client-side library there. Uh, Datadog is uh, our tool of choice for system metrics. We used to be deep in New Relic, but uh, we switched to Datadog. It just seems to be uh, just winning, winning. Every time we, we come across something new, we're like, wow, so glad we've changed, so there's that. Uh, and this is really good for... Uh, uh, sort of ex both for managing from an operations perspective, you know, we've got a, a Kubernetes clustering Google Cloud Platform where you, know, you come in here and you can see, you know, gaze upon all of your pods and nodes and see their RAM and CPU usage. But also if you're uh, just proactively trying to improve the health of the platform, you can come in and just see the slowest queries or the, the most time spent in certain requests and then get into a into a, uh, a sort of SQL explain, analyze, and see what's going on there. And uh, so, a really good tool for developers. And I know in, uh, often in, in uh, larger companies, these sort of tools get segmented away from the people actually doing the work. And I think that's that you lose a lot there when basically the people who end up doing the work can't explore, explore these type of insights. Log consolidation is. Uh, a, Probably a developer-specific uh, bit of data, but again, this is where it sounds, it sounds probably relatively simple these days, but there was a time when you know, that would be what the ops team sees and the developers don't get access to something like this. And it, it's hopefully a bit rarer these days with the whole uh, sort of uh, regression to common sense where like develop, development and operations are quite tightly coupled. But this is, this is like the screenshot I took uh, earlier, and it's about 150 milliseconds of logs. 
So we, we have them pouring in, and I think the key thing here is to ensure that whatever you do for, uh, for aggregating logs and, and storing them, A, make sure you can scale that because you're going to get a lot of logs if things go well, and B, make sure that you can query it efficiently. So even though we're getting gigabytes of logs probably every hour, um, uh, we can query them quite efficiently, and so that just means it doesn't matter how many we collect, we can, we can always uh, trawl through them. Error reporting is something that we actually get sent to our Slack. So if something unexpected happens in production, we've got a specific Slack channel which Bugsnag sends stuff to, and that lets us sort of instantly get alerted when there's problems, and you can mark things as resolved or snooze it or fixed, et cetera. And basically by having this information available to everyone in the company actually, like not that most people probably want to stick their nose in that Slack channel, but you're there and, it's, and it keeps you accountable. So there's no real hiding what's going on from everyone else in the organisation and I think, I think that's really healthy. Now one of the things we've implemented recently is, is a tool called Metabase and uh, all this is really is a sort of a, a way to sort of plug into a data source and, and just produce visualisations on demand. And that sounds relatively simple, but when you've got, uh, uh, when you're in a business like us, um, you can't just ship that really important data to a third-party service. You just you have to keep it uh, close. You can't. You, it's very difficult to establish enough trust with any any uh, product to sort of give it the, your core business data. So, Metabase lets you keep everything on site and. Uh, it lets us answer questions like, you know, who are popular merchants or this uh, chart you see here is how many people make purchases of less than $5 from a cafe or restaurant uh, at what time of the week. So the uh, rows are days and the columns are hours, so to speak, and the size of the bubble is how many customers are doing that. So you can see these, like, you know, everyone getting their morning coffee, et cetera, and then sort of tails off at the end of the day. Um, so... I think what we did with Metabase is quite interesting because it does solve the problem of uh, how do you basically give access to production data to your team without worrying, not worrying, but without having any privacy problems. So you could, for example, answer a lot of these questions by just saying, oh, someone just go in and, and do, some, do some queries in production. But that's not democratization. You'd have to, you'd have to funnel that through a, uh, uh, a sort of personal group of people that are effectively a bottleneck and they're going to have their own jobs to do. So what we, what we ended up doing was uh, basically splitting off a, uh, uh, another PostgreSQL database and sort of putting it in a, a separate production environment and then uh, asynchronously uh, with our, our background jobs uh, effectively doing an extract, transform, and load into that analytics database, which has a different schema, and never putting in any personal information. So we, we use a combination of uh, a, a, a gem called Multiverse, which allows you to have your active record models connect to multiple databases. So you might have, well, if you, if you have, basically you might have a, a model called customers and a model called analytics customers and they might connect to different databases. So the only constraint there is you can't have any joins or foreign keys between those models if they're in different databases. But what it lets you do is just have really simple monolithic Rails code, which we love, and, um, and, and, a, and a bunch of background workers, which we effectively uh, have cron jobs, for example, that might, every 10 seconds, it might check, hey, is there anything I need to sync to the analytics database? And by stripping out all sorts of uh, personally identifiable information, you end up with a database that just has anonymized facts and numbers, et cetera, that can be used by anyone. So that's proven very valuable. A lot of my time uh, up until recently has been spent answering ad hoc queries from executive types saying, oh, how many customers have done this? How much, how much money have we uh, uh, had under deposit recently, et cetera? And the more you can help people like that self-service, the better it is for everyone, including them, because a lot of their questions come on a weekend. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> so I think the key takeaways that I, I guess I want to impress upon you today is uh, the more you can trust and empower your team, the better. So a lot of, a lot of the culture in, in big organisations stems from, though it's not explicit, a sort of lack of trust um, and also a concern for privacy. 
And if you can solve the privacy, then uh, your data is a lot more valuable. Also, I guess when sending data to third parties, you don't ever want to send every, anyone particularly everything. So, you know, for example, with Amplitude, we'll just send sort of anonymized behavioral data. Like we'll have these, we'll just make a whole bunch of event names up and just send it there. And for, you know, Bug Snake, we send a, a facet, and for Datadog, we send different stuff. But you don't necessarily want to send any particular third party more than you need to. Now, the loose integration is an important point because we've changed a few times providers. Like I said, we changed from New Relic to Datadog. Uh, we also changed from, uh, let's change its name a few times. What was it called? Sentry to Bugsnag. So, so when we're writing our integrations, um, you know, the Ruby code that sort of sends the events or the JavaScript code, et cetera, we've learned now that uh, nothing's forever. Sometimes uh, vendors become either evil by really getting gougy on the pricing, or uh, not evil, it's, it's, it's actually a good thing. It supports the ecosystem of, of, of your of startups starting up and sort of makes companies who are doing fine pay all the money. Um, but also what, what, what else can happen is uh, sometimes um, companies stagnate with features and you, know, you don't want to be tied to them uh, so much so that you can't sort of get on the coattails of the up and coming Datadog, love Datadog. Um, yeah, and also plan for an increased focus on this. If you're in a small company and you're, and, you're, and you're becoming bigger, this stuff becomes much more important. It's easy to um, not worry about it when you're small, and that's fine, you don't need to. But uh, if you're ever sort of getting past the point where now you're talking to VCs for investment or something like that, then this is all they care about, I think. So they want all these metrics and insights and data, and you'll be, you'll be very busy uh, if you have to sort of back, back it in after the fact. Any questions? Oh, yeah. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Just hoping to leave some time for questions because it's a bit more interactive. <laughs> I have a question about your metrics gathering and metrics following. So I guess what I'm asking is how do you know if you're gathering the right information and you know, for example, if you gather a certain amount of information and it makes it look like your customers are really wanting to do X, Y, Z, do you end up going down a rabbit hole that way and perhaps missing the bigger picture because you weren't gathering all of the information or whatever? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, we, we often, uh, we, have, like, we have regret a lot of times, like, oh, I wish we collected more information about this thing that we now have no information on. But I think what we tend to try to do after learning those sort of lessons is just collect as much as we can. And so I think now nearly all of our uh, plans that we're on with any of these third-party services are just like, send us as much as you want, we pay them a lot of money now. And uh, so we just like, oh, fine, we will then. And, uh, and we, we do keep the bias in mind, but I guess we, we sort of have a really good, um, uh, we're in touch with our customers a lot, they have like talked to us and stuff like that. So we sort of get multiple sources of information about what, what they want and what they're doing. So. Yeah, we, we think, I think we've got a finger on a pulse in that respect. I, in fact, have two questions. The, the first one is when, you, when you're facing this dilemma of sending data to track events in particular, there are often two approaches. Either you send everything, and then at query time, you try to figure out if what's that something that you're looking, about, uh, looking for, or you send specific events, and then you have regret. Um, have you made any specific decisions in, in that regard? And question number two is, I'm just curious, re-identification of data is a, has been a big deal in Australia. Um, are there any particular laws or guidelines that you have to comply to make sure that the anonymized data that you're leaking into other providers is not re-identifiable? Mm -hmm. So your first question, uh, we, we basically go to the path of send more events and then work out how to query it later because all the problems of querying come on to the third parties. So whether it's Google or Amplitude or Datadog, they, they get the big bucks to have people with brains bigger than ours to, maybe not that big, but um, <laughs> uh, to work those problems out. We focus on you know, building, building what we build and, and uh, we, we lean on that a lot. So we definitely focus on, 
over sending data. But uh, as far as the the uh, privacy concerns, is that what you mean? The anonymous, yeah. Basically, we just don't send anything that's personally identifiable anywhere ever. Keep it simple. Like there's, if any of our uh, third party integrations got breached and they were a cluster of mess of incompetence and everything was sprawled everywhere. No one could trace it back to a specific customer, no matter what. So we, that's that's the sort of uh, mindset we have when we're integrating. So, you know, sure they'd know. Oh, there was lots of events that you know, lots of signups or lots of clicking this button, but they wouldn't be able to uh, relate it to any individuals, which is the main concern. Uh, how do you? Uh see when a user is uh, running in a flow that is unexpected? In Amplitude, for example, there's a, there's a feature which allows you to sort of pick an event and then it will show you the events they do before and after and it will, it will order them in order of uh, popularity and then you're like, what, how did, what would they go from there to there? Or, and, and it's just an exploratory tool where, you know, once you sort of get in there and you, and you sort of know a gist of what feature area you're going to work on or what you're trying to... Um, I said, get a better handle on you. Like, you just you just get a little insights like that. Just that simple thing of like a sequence of you know seven percent of customers before they uh, made a transfer did a pull to save. It's like, what are they doing? Are they trying to get their money back or like you know stuff like that? So, yeah. Uh, two quick questions. Well, the first one's quick. The um, the the flicker of the numbers, like, is that just the last number that's going up, or all the numbers? <laughs> they all go. I don't know why. They all go. <laughs> so I mean, even if it's only going up by one, they'll all flick. I don't. I'm, I'm not sure. Well, I think that's good because <laughs> yeah. it's, it's by design. <laughs> and then I suppose the other thing, my understanding, I might be completely wrong, and this might be stuff you don't want to tell. Um, up is about thirty developers, if I remember correctly, or thereabouts. How big is your data analytics team to pump this data out <laughs> and do that? Is it kind of just spare dev time that uses this up or have you kind of like said, right, we're out of X number of developers, we've got Y to, yeah, to no, do the this? First, the first one, the first one. Yeah, so, no. it's just, <laughs> so um, yeah, yeah, basically um, we don't have any sort of specific focus on the on the data science yet. We're, we're, that's why I sort of said, um, you know, plan for it to become more of a focus because that's exactly what we're seeing now. We're like... Okay, we're going to need to take this more seriously because uh, um, it's all it's all happening. So at the moment, it's sort of just a few devs that take a take an interest in it and sort of help other people in the team understand how to sort of get it all out. Any further questions? Let's hear it for Chris. Thank you so much. Thank you very much.